So I'm going to work a little bit backwards for this one, just to change the pace and the way of thinking for the immune support tonic. And I'm going to describe all the herbal actions and then see why it might relate to immune tonic support. The first herb in here is astragalus. This is a well-known immune modulator. I would describe this as more of a blood tonic rather than an immune stimulant. And it's like an adaptogen blood tonic for the immune system. In response to chronic stress from any source, this will help the immune system adapt to chronic stress. It also has a stimulating effect on the liver, an anti-inflammatory effect and antiviral effect. Some research shows that it reduces the incidence of recurrent colds. Another new herb to you is wild oats, and wild oats are nourishing and particularly good for stamina in the nervous system. And this is where the expression of sowing your wild oats comes from. I have to say I wish that more people were sowing their wild oats by having a wonderful time and being Casanovas, rather than sowing their wild oats by coping with chronic stress. But that would be a happy reason to have a stress on your nervous system and your immune system because you're having such a good time. But it's not that common in the patients that I see. Ashwagandha is a herb from the Ayurvedic tradition. It is an adaptogen that helps the body cope with stress via the adrenal glands and the cortisol response, which is the fight or flight response. Echinacea, we know, is an immune modulator, has a beneficial effect on the white cells and also acts as an alterative. We're going back a bit now to remember time, which is the antiseptic expectorant. Elderflower, you can see how frequently I use elderflower. It's just such a gentle, uplifting, nourishing, relaxing effect for the muscles and has a, such a wide usefulness. Lemon balm, I don't think we've come across before. And this is a lovely lemony scented member of the mint family. It's a digestive herb, a nervine, and has that wonderful lemony aroma that I mentioned. Licorice is an adaptogen expectorant, digestive soothing, and the ginger is in there to open up the circulation in the peripheral nervous system. It's also got a soothing effect on the digestive tract. It also is antimicrobial. So it's another one of those herbs that has a multi-function, multi-application. I include this small bit of licorice and ginger in many prescriptions because it has a unifying and disseminating effect on the rest of the herbs in the blend. So you can work backwards now, looking at the herbs that you can see either in Dr. Clare's blends or in any blend, to see what actions a blend of herbs might be aiming for with overlapping actions between the different herbs and the different actions that they have on the body. So we go back to our way of looking at what the body might need to support the bladder function. And these would also commonly have an effect on the kidney as well. But we're thinking about conditions like chronic cystitis, interstitial cystitis, recurrent cystitis, honeymoon cystitis, which is a condition of having a good time. And chemical irritant cystitis, people who have an irritant bladder in response to things like tea, coffee, wine. Many people describe symptoms which are like an irritable bowel, but they're actually an irritable bladder. And the irritability comes from the same nerve ending stimulation that's shared between the bowel and the bladder. And for some people, it's more emphasized in the bladder than it is in the digestion. Don't really know why. But these are people that would have a nervous bladder. If they are under pressure, they'll need to go to the loo frequently. So what actions might we like for a tissue that reflects this state? And it would be nice demulcent, soothing, nourishing, antiseptic to discourage infections. If there's any poor function anywhere, the body will be more likely and more prone to infections. So you might want an antiseptic action. You might want to promote flow through the urine so it's not in a stagnant condition. Again, promoting infections. You want immune support, you want nervines. As I say, there's a big connection between that nervous bowel and nervous bladder and the nervous system. Digestive herbs, again, the more effective and comfortable your digestion is, the more comfortable all of those reflex organs are. 
and hormone balancing. Women have a lot more problems after the menopause with cystitis, frequency, all of those bladder symptoms. And it can also relate to the menstrual cycle, where some people as part of PMS, they might be going to the loo more frequently or waking up at night in order to go to the loo. And of course, waking up at night for any reason has a secondary effect of stressing your whole metabolism. So we're looking at a very wide view of what herbal support might be helpful if you have bladder discomfort for any reason. Looking at the bladder soothing tea, we have corn silk. Now, corn silk is a herb that you're all familiar with because it's the silky threads inside the leaves that surround corn on the cob. When you pull back the outer leaves, there's these silky threads, and this is what corn silk herb is. And it is one of the few herbs, the other one that comes to mind is raspberry leaf, that is actually more effective because it's in a more concentrated form when it's dried. Most herbs are better fresh. But this is one of the few herbs that are actually better dried. And as you can imagine from holding those threads, they are soft and silky and soothing. And that's the demulsant action or reflects the demulsant action. Horsetail is a very different herb. It is spiky, a very unusual plant. It actually dates from prehistory, goes back to the time of the dinosaurs, and it is Spiky is the word that comes to mind, and crisp, you know, if you snap it, if you break the stem, it snaps. It's very rich in silica and very strengthening to the connective tissue. It has a diuretic effect. It is an immune enhancer. It also is good for um, stopping the flow of blood. So if people do have bleeding from the urinary tract, which would, of course, be investigated by a medical advisor, but it can be a useful effect... And it also has an astringent, that kind of leaky membrane drying effect. Horsetail is very nice side effects, which is to make your nails grow, your hair grow, strengthening the bones, anything that needs those minerals from this very unusual plant, and in particular the silica. Couch grass is one of those weed grasses that hops by trailers and is the scourge of gardeners. But herbally, one of those very successful weeds, so it's a very soothing, demulsant, diuretic, antiseptic and nutritive activity. And the buku uh, is a diuretic antibacterial. These combine well with organic cranberry juice, make sure there's no added sugar. The important thing with cranberry juice is that you don't need an awful lot of it. You just need an egg cup full twice or three times a day. It really shouldn't be taken by the glass full. If there's background stress combined with B complex, if there's recurrent infections combined with immune tonic blend. So this is just to kind of give you a sense that not all of these herbs or teas and tinctures are prescribed independent of each other. You can combine them for the action that that particular person needs depending on where the stress is happening in their body. And you can combine them with other natural remedies that might be helpful. This is the bladder support blend. Again, a lot of overlap. Sometimes the overlap is to increase the dosage for an acute flare-up. And sometimes it's because there are some people who just won't drink herb teas. And they would prefer to use something like the, the tonic on an ongoing basis. In general, the tonics are suitable for doing this. I just love that background effect of using the teas. But the bladder support blend can be used like this. The addition is the uva ursi. And many people, when they need their bladder support blend, it's because they've actually got uh, acute symptoms of their recurrent cystitis or bladder discomfort. And the uva ursi is also called bearberry. And it has a diuretic uh, urinary antiseptic effect. It's important with cystitis or with any other flare-up of a chronic condition. Remember I was describing the uh uh-oh moment? That's when you're going, "Uh uh-oh, my cystitis is about to play up. For short-term use, the bladder support blend can be used 5 mils every 1 to 3 hours, and that would be over 24, 48 hours, and then you would go back to the 3 times a day dose. In general, with acute flare-ups of any condition, you continue the, for instance, in this case, the bladder support blend, until 3 days after the symptoms of the cystitis have settled down and then continue with the bladder soothing tea for at least two weeks. And that would be the minimum. You want to use the higher dose 
concentrated tincture blends during the flare-up. Let the flare-up settle for three days while you continue the medication. And then using the tea in conjunction with the tincture, you continue the tea for at least two weeks and for longer for flare-ups of sinusitis because the sinuses are very hard to get into. So I would usually say for four to six weeks with an acute sinusitis using the sinus tea and the chest and sinus blend. That's just to start linking up all the various blends and teas that they're not distinct from each other. The same principles apply in general. In traditional use, uva ursi or bearberry is not used for long periods of time. I would suggest using it for six weeks and then taking a break for three weeks if you want to use it on a regular basis. Another point is that for women who get honeymoon cystitis, which is cystitis after sexual intercourse, some women find this blend useful to take after they have had sexual intercourse and another dose again the following morning. And they find that this helps along with emptying their bladder immediately after intercourse and definitely avoid too much sugar in the diet. So I put those concepts in this slide. You use the teas for longer term nourishment support for chronic or recurring problems and to support the actions of tincture blends for acute conditions. Just to repeat the general advice, stop any herbs that you're using on a long term basis. Stop for three weeks every three months. Traditionally, herbs were used for short-term in health and recovery was robust. Today's chronic and recurring conditions require nourishing and alterative, and I would say nervine actions for a longer period of time. So I think that's a change in how illness is affecting us in the 21st century as opposed to the 20th or the 19th or even the 15th century. The reason for stopping the herbs for three weeks every three months is entirely pragmatic. It's a practical thing. It's a washout time to see if the herbs are still needed and to allow your tissues to just go back into that resting phase where they're not actively healing and to see if they still require healing. Because unless you're using them just as a refreshing tea, I don't particularly like people using medicinal herbs if they don't need them.